the Pope just said something that's making Christians around the world question everything they believe. His call for a one-world religion isn't just controversial. It might be the biggest threat to true faith we've ever seen. But here's what's really scary. This isn't the first time religious leaders have tried to unite all faiths. History shows us that when religion and politics mix, the results can be catastrophic. Are we heading down a dangerous path? Let's find out. Pope Francis recently made a statement that's sending shockwaves through the Christian world. In a surprising move, he called for a one-world religion. This isn't just another headline. It's a declaration that's making believers everywhere question the very foundations of their faith. Let's take a closer look at what the Pope actually said. During a recent interfaith gathering, Pope Francis proclaimed, All religions are different paths leading to the same God. He went on to say, West, We must create a new global system of brotherhood and unity among all faiths. Now, if you're familiar with traditional Catholic teaching, you're probably feeling a bit uneasy right now. And you should be. For centuries, the Catholic Church has taught that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. The idea that all religions are equal paths to God? That's a complete 180 from what Catholics have believed for 2,000 years. Catholic leaders and theologians are scrambling to make sense of the Pope's words. Some are trying to uh, explain them away, saying he was misunderstood or taken out of context. But others are openly criticizing the Pope, calling his statement heretical and dangerous. Father Thomas Sullivan, a respected Catholic theologian, didn't mince words. If the Pope truly believes all religions lead to God, he's rejecting the very heart of Christianity. This is a grave error that could lead many astray. But here's where it gets really interesting. Some Christians are looking at the Pope's declaration and seeing something eerily familiar. They're asking, could this be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Pay close attention, because this is where things get shocking. In the book of Revelation, there's a warning about a false religious system that will arise in the last days. It's described as a great harlot that sits on many waters symbolizing its influence over people and nations worldwide. Revelation 17, 1-2 says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Many Bible scholars interpret this as a prediction of a one-world religious system that will unite all faiths under a single authority. Sound familiar? It's hard to ignore the parallels between this prophecy and Pope Francis's call for a one-world religion. But the Pope's words aren't the only sign that something big is happening. There's more to this story, and it goes deeper than you might think. The push for religious unity isn't new, and its history is filled with dark chapters that many have forgotten or never learned. As we dive into the past, we'll uncover shocking attempts to unite all religions under one banner. And let me tell you, the consequences were nothing short of catastrophic. Are we seeing history repeat itself? Or is this something even more significant? Let's find out. History has a way of repeating itself, but sometimes the echoes are too faint to hear. That is, until now. The Pope's call for religious unity might seem revolutionary, but it's actually an old song with a new beat. What if the key to understanding our future lies buried in the past? Brace yourself 
because the skeletons we're about to unearth from history's closet might just change everything you thought you knew about faith and power. Let's turn back the clock and look at some shocking attempts to unite all religions under one banner. You might think religious freedom has always been a given, but you'd be wrong. In ancient Rome, emperors didn't just rule the land. They tried to rule the heavens, too. They forced everyone to worship them as gods. And if you refused, well, let's just say the lions in the Colosseum were well fed. But it didn't stop there. Fast forward to medieval Europe, and you'll find the Catholic Church flexing its muscles in ways that would make a bodybuilder jealous. Ever heard of the Inquisition? It wasn't just about rooting out heretics. It was about enforcing a single unified belief system. And trust me, their methods of persuasion were far from gentle. Now you might be thinking, surely these were just power-hungry tyrants. Real religious leaders wouldn't do this, right? Wrong. Throughout history, we've seen well-meaning attempts to blend different faiths, thinking it would bring peace. But here's the kicker. It often led to confusion and a watering down of core beliefs. Imagine trying to mix oil and water. That's what happened when some tried to blend Christianity with local pagan practices. The result? A spiritual smoothie that left everyone with a bad taste in their mouth. People didn't know what to believe anymore, and their faith became as mixed up as a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces. But here's where it gets really interesting. Remember the Protestant Reformation? It wasn't just about Martin Luther nailing some complaints to a church door. It was a full-blown rebellion against the idea that one religious authority could dictate what everyone should believe. People were willing to die for the right to worship as they saw fit. So, how does Pope Francis's call for a one-world religion stack up against these historical attempts? It's like deja vu all over again. The same promises of peace and unity are being made, but at what cost? Are we willing to sacrifice the core of our beliefs for the sake of getting along? This is where it gets shocking. The concept of a one-world religion isn't just about holding hands and singing Kumbaya. It's a direct threat to traditional Christian beliefs. If all paths lead to God, what happens to the unique role of Jesus Christ? What about the Bible's teachings on salvation? These aren't just theological nitpicks. They're the very foundation of Christian faith. But there's an even more troubling aspect to the Pope's statement that we need to address. It's not just about what he said. It's about what he might be denying. And trust me, you're not going to want to miss this next part. Imagine a world where Jesus Christ is no longer the exclusive path to salvation. Sounds impossible, right? Well, Pope Francis's latest declaration has left millions of believers stunned, questioning everything they thought they knew about their faith. What could he possibly have said to cause such an uproar? Let's break it down. Pope Francis recently stated, all religions are different paths leading to the same God. He even went further, calling for a new global system of brotherhood and unity among all faiths. Now, if you're familiar with traditional Christian teaching, you're probably feeling your jaw hit the floor right about now. Here's why this is so shocking. For 2,000 years, Christianity has taught that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. It's not just a minor detail, it's the very foundation of the faith. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he wasn't leaving much room for interpretation. 
So when the Pope suggests that all religions lead to God, he's not just making a controversial statement. He's potentially denying the unique role of Jesus Christ in salvation. This isn't just a theological debate. It's a seismic shift that's shaking the very foundations of Christianity. But don't just take my word for it. Christian leaders around the world are speaking out. Protestant and Orthodox leaders are sounding the alarm, warning that the Pope's words could lead to a dangerous watering down of essential Christian doctrines. They're concerned that this blurs the lines between truth and falsehood, potentially leading millions astray. Now you might be wondering, what does the Bible say about all this? Well, it's pretty clear. In 1 John 2, 23 we read, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Strong words, right? The Bible doesn't mince words when it comes to denying Christ's unique role. So what evidence do we have that Pope Francis might be denying the uniqueness of Jesus Christ? Well, his statement about all religions leading to God is a big red flag. If that's true, then Christ's sacrifice on the cross becomes unnecessary. His claim to be the only way to the Father becomes just one option among many. It's a complete reversal of traditional Christian teaching. But here's what's really troubling. The Vatican hasn't issued any clarification or defense of the Pope's statements. Their silence is speaking volumes, leaving many to interpret this as a significant shift in Catholic doctrine. It's like watching a theological earthquake in slow motion, and no one knows how big the aftershocks will be. This controversy isn't happening in a vacuum, though. There's a bigger picture we need to see. The push for religious unity isn't new, and it's not just coming from the Pope. We're seeing a global shift towards a more inclusive, but potentially less distinct form of spirituality. And that's where things get really interesting and potentially dangerous for traditional faith. Are we witnessing the birth of a new world religion? Or is this just a misunderstanding blown out of proportion? One thing's for sure. The religious landscape is changing faster than ever before, and we need to pay close attention to what happens next. Because if history has taught us anything, it's that when it comes to faith, the stakes couldn't be higher. While the world debates the Pope's words, an eerie silence echoes from the depths of history. Hidden in the pages of ancient texts lie prophecies that seem to mirror our present day with chilling accuracy. What did these seers of old foresee? And why does it matter now more than ever? The book of Revelation, that mysterious final chapter of the Bible, isn't just a collection of cryptic symbols and frightening visions. It's a warning, a roadmap of sorts, pointing to a time when religious deception would sweep across the globe. And here's the kicker. Many biblical scholars believe we're living in those very times right now. Let's take a closer look at what these ancient prophecies actually say. In Revelation chapter 13, we find a chilling prediction of a future where the masses will follow a figure known as the beast. This isn't some Hollywood monster. It's a symbol of a unified but spiritually misled society. Sound familiar? Some believe this aligns perfectly with Pope Francis's call for a one-world religion. But it doesn't stop there. Revelation 18.3 warns of nations that have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. Now you might be wondering what that means. Biblical experts interpret this as a prophecy of a global religious shift 
one that looks eerily similar to the Pope's recent actions and statements. Here's where it gets really interesting. The Pope's emphasis on unity and overcoming division isn't just about playing nice. Some see it as an attempt to regain power lost by the papacy during the Dark Ages. And guess what? Biblical prophecy suggests this is necessary for the healing of the deadly wound of the Antichrist. It's like watching puzzle pieces fall into place right before our eyes. But how closely do the Pope's actions really match these predictions? Let's break it down. The ecumenical movement led by Pope Francis is seen by many as a commitment to spreading a false religious system. It's not about salvation, critics argue, but about entrapping people in spiritual confusion. This aligns chillingly well with the Babylon described in Revelation, a symbol of false religion that deceives the nations. As our world becomes more interconnected, the push for a one-world religion is seen as a clear sign of the coming end times. Revelation 14 stands in stark opposition to this agenda, calling believers to remain faithful in the face of growing deception. So what does all this mean for us today? These ancient scriptures aren't just dusty old predictions. They're warnings we need to heed. They speak of a global religious system that will unite people under a false banner of peace and unity. And when we look at current events, it's hard not to see the parallels. But prophecy isn't just about predicting the future. It's a call to action, a warning to stay alert and stand firm in our faith. As we watch these events unfold, we need to ask ourselves, are we prepared for what comes next? Because if these prophecies are true, the biggest challenges to our faith may be just around the corner. The word Antichrist sends shivers down the spines of many Christians. It's a term we associate with the end times, deception, and spiritual warfare. But what if this figure isn't just a future threat? What if he's already here, wearing the most trusted religious garb in the world? In Christian theology, the Antichrist is described as a powerful figure who will rise to prominence in the last days, deceiving many and opposing the true teachings of Christ. The Bible paints a picture of someone who will be charismatic, influential, and able to perform signs and wonders that will mislead even the elect. Now here's where things get controversial. Some Christians are drawing parallels between Pope Francis's actions and the biblical descriptions of the Antichrist. They point to his calls for religious unity, his statements about all religions leading to God, and his push for a new global system of brotherhood as evidence that he might be fulfilling these ancient prophecies. But why are they so concerned? Let's look at what the Bible actually says. In 2 Thessalonians, we're warned about a man of lawlessness who will exalt himself above every god and object of worship. In Revelation, we read about a beast who will have authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Some believers see Pope Francis's global influence and his calls for a one-world religion as eerily similar to these descriptions. It's not just modern Christians making this connection. Did you know that many Protestant reformers, including Martin Luther and John Calvin, viewed the papacy itself as the Antichrist? They believed that the Pope's claim to be the Vicar of Christ on earth was a form of blasphemy, setting himself up as a rival to Jesus. Now you might be thinking, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. And you're right to be skeptical. But here's why some Christians are taking it seriously. They see Pope Francis's actions as part of a bigger picture 
a series of events that seem to be aligning with biblical end times prophecies. His emphasis on environmental issues, his calls for global governance, and his push for interfaith dialogue are all seen as potential signs. But what other evidence might confirm or refute this theory? Some point to the Pope's Jesuit background, claiming that the Jesuit order has long sought to undermine Protestantism and establish a universalist gospel. Others look at his stance on traditional Catholic doctrines, arguing that his more liberal interpretations are paving the way for a watered-down, all-inclusive faith that denies the uniqueness of Christ. So why are some Christians viewing Pope Francis's actions as a sign of the Antichrist's arrival? It's not just about one man or one set of statements. It's about a pattern they see emerging, a push for global unity at the expense of biblical truth, a redefinition of what it means to be Christian, and a blurring of the lines between different faiths. For those who take Bible prophecy seriously, these developments are deeply troubling. Whether or not you believe this theory, one thing is clear. Pope Francis's words and actions are having real-world consequences. They're reshaping how millions of people view faith, unity, and the role of religion in society. And as we'll see next, the implications of this shift extend far beyond just religious matters. While Pope Francis stands in the spotlight, another player lurks in the wings. The Jesuit order, founded in 1534, has been accused of manipulating global affairs for centuries. But here's the twist. Pope Francis is the first Jesuit to ever wear the papal crown. Is this a coincidence, or are we? Witnessing the culmination of a plan set in motion nearly 500 years ago? The answer might change everything you thought you knew about the future of faith. The Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuits, isn't just another religious order. They're a powerful force within the Catholic Church, with a history that reads like a conspiracy theorist's wildest dreams. Founded by Ignatius of Loyola, the Jesuits quickly became known for their unwavering loyalty to the Pope and their mission to counter the Protestant Reformation. But here's where things get really interesting. The Jesuits have long been accused of some pretty shocking activities. We're talking political manipulation, undermining Protestant beliefs, and even trying to establish a universal religion under the Pope's authority. It sounds like something out of a Dan Brown novel, doesn't it? But these accusations have persisted for centuries. Now let's fast forward to today. Pope Francis, the man calling for a one world religion, just happens to be the first Jesuit Pope in history. Coincidence? Many think not. Some believe his Jesuit background is the key to understanding his push for ecumenism and interfaith dialogue. But critics warn that this approach might be diluting traditional Christian teachings. Here's where it gets really controversial. Some people believe the Jesuits have a secret agenda to crush Protestantism once and for all. They point to the order's historical opposition to the Reformation and their reputation for using any means necessary to achieve their goals. Could Pope Francis's calls for unity be part of this centuries-old plan? The Jesuit influence doesn't stop at the church doors either. They've been linked to global affairs, with some claiming they pull strings in politics, education, and even international relations. It's like a shadowy hand guiding events behind the scenes. And now, with a Jesuit at the helm of the Catholic Church, some fear their power has reached new heights. But how does all this tie into the idea of a one-world religion? 
Well, think about it. If the Jesuits really are working to unite all faiths under the Pope's authority, wouldn't a global religious system be the perfect way to do it? Critics argue that Pope Francis's interfaith initiatives and emphasis on unity are just steps towards this ultimate goal. So, what role does the Jesuit order really play in Pope Francis's agenda for global religious unification? While we can't know for sure, the connections are hard to ignore. The Jesuit emphasis on obedience to the Pope, their historical efforts to counter Protestantism, and their alleged involvement in global affairs all seem to align with the push for a one-world religion. But the Jesuit influence extends beyond just religious matters. In fact, their reach might be even more extensive than you think. And as we'll see next, it touches on an issue that affects every single person on this planet. Are you ready to uncover the surprising connection between the Jesuits, Pope Francis, and the future of our environment? From the halls of the Vatican to the forests of the Amazon, a green revolution is underway. But this isn't just about saving trees. What if I told you that Pope Francis's environmental crusade could be the key to uniting all religions under one banner? Get ready to discover how a green Sabbath might just be the first step towards a one world religion. Pope Francis has been making waves with his stance on climate change. In his encyclical Laudato Si, he doesn't just talk about melting ice caps and rising sea levels. He frames environmental issues as a moral and spiritual crisis. It's not just about recycling anymore. It's about the very soul of humanity. But here's where things get interesting. The Pope isn't just calling for better recycling programs. He's pushing for a complete overhaul of how we live our lives. And some people are starting to see a hidden agenda behind all this green talk. Let's talk about the Green Sabbath. It sounds innocent enough, right? A day of rest to help the planet heal. But critics are warning that this could be the first step towards a mandatory global day of rest. And guess who would be in charge of that? You got it. A unified religious authority. Think about it. If all faiths agree to rest on the same day for the sake of the environment, we're suddenly looking at a world where religious practices are being dictated by a single source. It's like mixing environmentalism with Sunday school. And the result could be a cocktail of control that affects every aspect of our lives. But it doesn't stop there. The Pope's environmental push is being seen by some as a way to reestablish control over global religious practices. By framing climate change as a moral issue, he's creating common ground between different faiths. And while that might sound nice, it could be paving the way for a loss of individual religious identity. Here's where it gets really shocking. Some critics are drawing parallels between these environmental initiatives and end times prophecies. They're warning that this push for unity through environmentalism could be setting the stage for the Antichrist. It sounds extreme, but when you look at how quickly things are changing, it's hard not to wonder. So is there a hidden spiritual aspect to these environmental pushes? Many think so. They see the emphasis on our common home as a stepping stone to a common faith. And if that faith is led by a single authority figure, we're suddenly looking at a scenario that reads like a chapter from the book of Revelation. But here's the real kicker. The Pope's environmental stance isn't just about planting trees or reducing carbon emissions. It's directly connected to the idea of a mandatory global rest day. By linking environmental concerns with religious practices, 
he's creating a powerful tool for uniting people under a single banner. And that banner just might be the flag of a one world religion. As we've seen, the push for religious unity has many facets. From interfaith dialogue to environmental initiatives, the ground is being prepared for something big. But the environment isn't the only way. Hearts and minds are being influenced. In fact, there's another group being targeted that might surprise you. And it's a group that holds the key to the future of faith itself. Imagine a world where all religions are considered equal paths to God. Sounds peaceful, right? But what if this idea is being carefully cultivated in the minds of our youth? Pope Francis's outreach to young people of all faiths isn't just about bringing people together. It's reshaping the very foundation of belief for an entire generation. Let's take a closer look at what's really happening. Pope Francis has been hosting interfaith youth events that are drawing thousands of young people from different religious backgrounds. On the surface, it looks like a celebration of diversity. But dig a little deeper, and you'll find something more troubling. These events aren't just about making friends across faith lines. They're promoting a message of religious equality that goes far beyond simple tolerance. Young people are being told that all religions are valid ways to reach God. It's a feel-good message that's spreading like wildfire on social media and at youth rallies. But here's where it gets scary. This message of equality isn't just challenging traditional beliefs. It's completely rewriting them. Christian youth are being taught that Jesus Christ isn't the only way to salvation. It's a complete 180 from what the Bible teaches. And it's happening right under our noses. Think about the long-term impact of this. We're raising a generation of young Christians who might not see any problem with practicing multiple faiths or blending different religious traditions. The unique claims of Christianity are being watered down to the point where they might become meaningless. The Washington Times reported that some religious leaders in the United States are sounding the alarm. They're warning that the Pope's approach to interfaith dialogue could compromise core Christian beliefs and their right to be concerned. This isn't just about getting along. It's about the very future of Christianity. Here's a shocking statistic for you. Nearly 75% of the world's population belongs to one of the five. Major faiths. That's a lot of diversity. And it's exactly what young people are being exposed to. But instead of being taught how to engage with other faiths while staying true to their own beliefs, they're being told that all paths are equally valid. So how might young Christians be misled by this message? It's simple. If all religions lead to God, then what's the point of holding on to the teachings of Jesus Christ? Why bother with the difficult parts of Christian faith if you can pick and choose from a buffet of spiritual options? This isn't just speculation. Many believe that the Pope's interfaith initiatives are deliberately preparing young people for a future where religious equality is the norm. It's a future where the lines between faiths are blurred and where traditional Christian teachings about salvation through Christ alone are seen as outdated or even intolerant. As we've seen, the push for religious unity has many facets. From environmental initiatives to youth outreach, a new world order is being shaped right before our eyes. But what does it all mean for the future of faith? And more importantly, how can true believers stand strong in the face of this growing pressure to conform? The answers might surprise you. 
and they're more urgent than you think. In a world that's pushing for unity, at all costs, what's the price of staying true to your beliefs? The answer lies in a 2,000-year-old playbook that's more relevant now than ever before. Are you ready to discover how to stand firm without standing alone? Let's face it, being a traditional Christian today isn't easy. With Pope Francis calling for a one-world religion and interfaith youth events, blurring the lines between faiths, it can feel like you're swimming against the tide. But here's the thing, this isn't the first time believers have faced pressure to conform. Remember the early Christians? They weren't exactly popular in ancient Rome. Refusing to worship the emperor as a god could get you thrown to the lions. But they stood firm, even in the face of death. Why? Because they knew the truth was worth dying for. Fast forward to today, and we're facing a different kind of pressure. It's not about worshiping emperors anymore. It's about compromising our beliefs for the sake of unity. But here's what you need to know. True unity can only come through Jesus Christ, not by watering down the truth. So how can you stand strong when the world is telling you to blend in? The Bible gives us a blueprint. In Ephesians 6.13, Paul tells us to take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. This isn't just flowery language. It's a battle plan for spiritual warfare. But what does this look like in practice? First, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. That means digging deep into Scripture, not just skimming the surface. Join a Bible study group listen to solid teaching, and ask tough questions. The more you understand your faith, the harder it will be to shake. Next, surround yourself with like-minded believers. In a world that's increasingly hostile to traditional Christian beliefs, you need a support system. Find a church that teaches the full gospel, not a watered-down version build relationships with other believers who can encourage you when times get tough. But don't just huddle in a Christian bubble. Jesus called us to be salt and light in the world. That means engaging with people of different beliefs, but doing so without compromising your own. Learn to articulate your faith clearly and lovingly. You might be surprised at how many people are hungry for truth in a world of spiritual confusion. Here's what's really at stake. If Christians compromise their beliefs, we risk losing the very essence of our faith. The message of salvation through Christ alone isn't just another religious option. It's the heart of the gospel. If we let that go, what's left? So what steps can you take right now to stand firm? Start by committing to daily Bible study and prayer. These aren't just religious rituals. They're your lifeline to God. Next, get involved in a solid church community. And finally, be prepared to lovingly explain your faith to others, even when it's not popular. As we wrap up, let's consider the bigger picture. The push for a one-world religion isn't just controversial. It's a sign of the times we're living in. But remember this, God is still in control. Stay alert, stand firm in your faith, and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The road ahead might be challenging, but with God's help, you can stand strong. The signs are all around us. Pope Francis's call for a one world religion isn't just another headline. It's a wake-up call for believers everywhere. We're living in times that ancient prophecies warned about, and the pressure to compromise our faith is growing stronger every day. But here's the truth. Real unity can't come from watering down our beliefs. 
It only comes through Jesus Christ. As the world pushes for a false peace built on spiritual confusion, we need to stand firm more than ever. Remember, God is still in control. No matter how chaotic things seem, He's not surprised by any of this. Our job isn't to panic. It's to stay alert and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The road ahead might be rough, but with God's help, we can stand strong in the face of deception. So, what's next? It's time to dig deep into God's Word, surround ourselves with fellow believers, and be ready to share the truth in love. The battle for faith is real, but we're not fighting alone. Are you ready to stand firm in these last days?